Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Social Work Bubble podcast. I'm your host, Laura, and I practice as a therapist in New York City. I have my bachelor's and master's in social work, and I currently work in outpatient mental health. Although in a few weeks, I will be transitioning into a private practice. So another podcast in the future will detail that experience a little bit more. It's not my own private practice. I will be joining a group practice. Um, But today, we are going to be talking about my experience with the licensing exam, the ASWB exam, to be a licensed master social worker. This was quite some time in the making, so I'm really excited to finally be here and share my experience. So let's get started. Um, I graduated with my master's in social work from Columbia University in May 2020, I had a lot of support from professors regarding licensing, even at the bachelor's level. There was a lot of education around like, what's helpful, what's the point of a master's, the benefits of getting a license, and how you can obtain that. I do live in New York State, so um, I'm not sure of how this varies state to state. There was some conversation about what this looks like in New Jersey, just because I live in New York City, and so you know, they were very close together. Um, But just so you guys know, this is mostly just based on my experience getting licensed in New York. Even though the LMSW exam with the Association of Social Work Boards, I believe is what the ASWB stands for, even though it's the same exact exam across the nation, each state has different licensing standards, not standards, but paths to obtain your license. So just keep that in mind. Um, So basically when I was in grad school, I was only in grad school for a year because I did the advanced standing program. Since I had my bachelor's in social work, you can do advanced standing to get your master's in one year. Um, And like I said, I went to school in New York City. We had the option of being able to take the licensing exam in New Jersey while we were still in school. So basically for New Jersey, you didn't have to have graduated already to take the licensing exam. So it was actually pretty common practice for people to, people that were New York based, take their licensing exam in New Jersey while they were still in school and then transfer the score from New Jersey to New York. So that way, by the time they actually graduated, you were licensed and ready to go. The reason that people do this is because in New York State, you cannot take your licensing exam or even apply to take it until you have proof of graduation with your MSW. So some people found, you know, that was really helpful for them. I really waited out. Some part of me does regret not taking it in New Jersey because I didn't get my license until a year after I graduated grad school, which, again, we'll get more into. Um, And so part of me is just like, I should have just gotten it over with in grad school. But there's also a lot going on. And to be quite honest, I think if I had taken it in grad school, I don't know if I would have been prepared. Um, And I don't know if I would have passed on the first try. So it is what it is. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. But we move forward. Um, So I ended up deciding to take the test in New York. Um, there was also some hassle for some people in dealing with the, you know, the bureaucracy and lack of communication and transferring a score from state to state. Um, and also during that time, that was May 2020, was when I graduated. Um, the pandemic, COVID, all of that had been happening for a few months now. Um, after graduating, I had stayed on at my internship from grad school. I had stayed on as a clinician. I had my temporary permit. So I'm not going to get into like every single detailed form that you need. If you live in New York State and you go into the Office of Professions, it will basically, it'll give you the whole checklist. It'll detail exactly what forms you need for exactly what purpose. It has it all laid out there for you. So that's with the New York State Office of Professions. And typically in grad school, talk to your advisor, but they should also prepare you for that as well and help navigate that for you because graduate schools also have to be the ones to send out your proof of graduation. So they should be helping in that process anyways. 
I talk about the Office of Professions to say that also lays out how you get your temporary permit. So I was able to get my temporary permit. Um, My supervisor signed off on it. They had to show their proof of licensure and take other steps as well. So that way I was able to have a pretty smooth transition from intern to clinician. I was able to practice with my temporary permit. The temporary permit only lasts for 12 months. You are not able to renew it. You can't do any of that, okay? The only time that I'm aware of in New York State where you were able to, you weren't able to get an extension, but if for some reason you were very close to your permit expiring and you had to take the licensing exam and maybe you failed the first time and you had to take it again, but your permit was going to expire before the three month date because when you take the licensing exam, you have to wait three months before you can take it again. So if your permit was going to expire before that three month period was up, you would be able to basically get a note saying, hey, my job is basically in danger if I don't get my license. Then, at least in New York State, they will say, okay, fine, we'll give you an exception to the three-month rule and you can take your licensing exam again before the three months is up. So that can potentially happen as well. That was a lot of information, I apologize. Um, So during this time, I would say even towards the beginning of grad school or beginning of your last year of grad school, that's when you really want to start really laying out what this process is going to look like lay out a good timeline, and also know things take time, okay? This is a lot of paperwork. Everyone in the state is doing it at the same time. So there are some things at certain time periods where it takes a lot longer to process paperwork. So be mindful of that. Um, It took a little bit for me to get my temporary permit. Um, It worked out. I only ended up having to take a few couple weeks off of work between that time, right? Because you can't practice without a temporary permit. Um, But I wasn't an intern anymore. So I did have to take a couple weeks off um, to navigate that. So I have my temporary permit. I'm practicing as a therapist in New York State. Um, And basically what happened was I scheduled my exam. I scheduled my first exam just a couple months after graduation. And then I was notified that because of COVID, the test center was closed and my exam was rescheduled to a completely another location in like a different state, which didn't make any sense to me at all. I don't know why that happened. Perhaps there was just something wrong with the system. I think a lot of things were just very strange because there was so much rescheduling, so many changes with the pandemic. So I was able to reschedule it and... I studied the best that I could. Um, I, let's see, what kind of materials did I use? Actually, you know what? I'll talk about the materials I used in a moment. Basically, I studied. I, you know, went over some of the materials. I had scheduled my exam. And when you schedule the exam, you can pick the location that it's at if that works with your schedule. I picked a Saturday at eight o'clock in the morning. I don't know why I did this. (laughs) Um, It's truly beyond me because at this point I had already been burnt out from my job. Just (laughs) so like my first exam was I had scheduled, it had gotten rescheduled because of COVID. So like I'm finally scheduled again. I'd been studying for a few months now, a few months later and I was burnt out from work by this point. I worked, like I said, I still work in the same place right now. Um, It was at a community mental health clinic. I had a crazy high caseload of like 55 clients I was working with for weekly therapy sessions. Some of those people I saw more than once a week. It was insane. I felt like I had no time for myself. I had no time to study. I had no time for anything else in my life which means I had no time to study. I had no time to really be prepared for this exam. 
along with that, my sleep schedule was so crazy because of my weird work hours, because of just the overwhelm and the burnout. Why I would schedule such an important exam for a Saturday at eight o'clock in the morning when I have never woken up on a Saturday at eight o'clock in the morning since I started this job, it was beyond me. And perhaps you know where I'm going with this, but the day of the exam comes and I sleep through my alarms and I miss my exam. And what do you know? I am out $270 because it is not refunded and you have to pay every time you take the exam. So the first actual try for me to take the exam, I missed it because I overslept because I had unrealistic standards and expectations for myself that I would wake up in time for an eight o'clock Saturday morning exam. So this <laughs> is a friendly reminder to please be honest with yourself, okay? Who wants to take an important exam at eight o'clock in the morning? If that's the only thing that works for your schedule, go ahead, but I don't recommend it unless you're a morning person. I'm a morning person now, but at the time of taking that exam, I was not. And then I was out a significant amount of money. And for a person that was only a few months post-grad in a community mental health clinic, being out $270 was not a good thing. So anyways, after that frustrating experience, not with anyone else, I was frustrated with myself, I rescheduled my exam for a few months later. The problem with this, right, was keep in mind, I have my temporary permit. My temporary permit was basically going to expire <laughs> um, like two weeks after this next exam was scheduled, but I had nowhere else in my time for work, for anything, to block out that time, like the four hours for the exam. So basically, the second time around, I scheduled my exam for a Saturday at three o'clock in the afternoon. But because I wanted a Saturday, because I wanted an afternoon time, the next availability wasn't until like five months later or something. Um, which honestly, I felt really good about. Um, I thought it gave me enough time. I went into my Google Drive, I had an Excel sheet, and I made a daily study plan, basically that went through all of the materials that I used, which is what I'll go into now. So basically, actually, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack again, I apologize, this is a mess today. Um, I take the exam, it's a Saturday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, um, the time made a lot more sense for me. My work at the mental health clinic hadn't slowed down. My temporary permit was about to expire pretty soon. I was very stressed out. Um, I was very concerned that I would have to leave my job because I was cutting it so close in terms of taking the exam and my temporary permit. Um, and I just, I didn't want to have to, there was just so much going on. I was very stressed out. Um, but the day of the exam came and I passed it on the first try of actually taking the exam. I, I was, it was such a relief. For my exam, you needed 98 questions to pass, and I got 125 questions out of the 150 that were actually scored. On the licensing exam, there is a total of 170 questions. 20 of those questions are unscored because they're basically test questions for future exams. So your grade is calculated based on the 150 questions. Each test varies. There are some tests where you need 105 in order to pass because the questions are weighed differently. For my exam, you needed 98 questions to pass. For some other people's exam, you needed 108. It really varies. From what I've seen, it appears it's this range between like 97 and 110 to pass out of 150. So it was a relief, to say the least, that I passed the exam. 
the first thing in understanding your own process and getting prepared for the licensing exam is understanding your studying style. Now, from my situation, I was a year out of grad school, so I had to really refresh my memory. You know, I had just been working nonstop. Like I said, I was burnt out. I hadn't really like read a book <laughs> or studied in what felt like a very long time. You know, when you spend literally all of your life going to school and studying a year off, I mean, it takes time to really get back into it. For me personally, I typically read best or I study best and learn through reading out loud and writing with mind maps. I love whiteboards. I have had a whiteboard since I was in middle school. I still have a whiteboard today, even though I don't study. It is one of my best friends. <laughs> um, so basically in my process, I read through the material. I highlight the material as I read through. Um, during that time, I also make flashcards on Quizlet. Then I read through a second or a third time. As I'm reading, again, I'm reading out loud. I'm in a quiet, silent space. I can't really have noise going on around me. Um, I also, part of why I like using a whiteboard is because I enjoy pretending that I'm teaching a class. That's what helps me really understand the material. So I use the whiteboard to review the content. I make mind maps on the whiteboard. You know, you, you do what you have to do to see the connections. And I'm teaching the information to myself, but it feels like, you know, I pretend I'm a professor, that I'm like really cool, a very intelligent, educated professor, and it's a great time. <laughs> um, during my commute, because I would drive to work and I'd leave about an hour and a half early because my commute is ridiculous. Um, I also had a playlist of LMSW topics videos on YouTube, so I would just play that playlist during my commute. One of the resources I used, which again, right now I'm going to get into those resources, one of them I used was the Therapist Development Center. I would highly, highly recommend if you are able to afford it uh, or if you're able to you know, scrap together some money to be able to use this resource, please do, because it was so helpful for me, the materials that they provided, but also the audio. So basically the Therapist Development Center, it has, oh my gosh, it has so much material for studying for the licensing exam, a whole entire, I mean, multiple modules. They have huge audio clips of like the top 50 topics that are mentioned in the licensing exams, whole bunch of worksheets. It's just the resources are incredible. That was one of my favorite resources because I, I've traveled a lot over the weekends because I've had some things going on. And so during these long, like six to eight hour car trips, I would have the audio of the therapist development center on in the, on during the car ride. And I'd put it at like two times speed so I would get through a lot of it and it would keep me engaged and you know you really just go through a lot of the material that really focused on prioritizing the material as well so basically what are the most common topics what things do you really need to prioritize and understand um, the other thing I used a lot was the Dawn Apgar study guide so when I say I like to read through material and highlight and make flashcards I use the Dawn Apgar study guide. I printed it out. I had a binder. I highlighted everything in it. I also used the pocket prep app, which I really enjoyed. They have a thousand practice questions and I went through almost all of them. Um, I did a lot of practice questions and what I really liked about the pocket prep app is you also have to pay for that. I think it's like $12 a month or $24 a month, something like that. Um, with pocket prep, you can do as many questions as you want every single day. And if you get a question wrong, and even if you get a question right, it'll give you the reason why. And it'll also tell you where it got that information. So a lot of the times it was referencing the Don Apgar book or, you know, another popular study guide. So that was really helpful. And I was also able to go back into all the questions I would get wrong. You could 
specifically have quizzes for only the questions that you got wrong so you could really understand what topics you weren't getting right it would also show you statistics you know on what topics um you weren't doing too hot in (laughs) so that maybe you want to hone your skills better um I also had study guides from past students, so some people attended different boot camps, some people, you know, attended different workshops, whatever it was. That was the one one benefit. <laughs> um, that was one of many benefits of grad school was connecting with alumni, connecting with people that knew someone else that took the exam and had resources. So basically, I had study guides from people I've never even met before, but because I knew someone who knew this person who knew this person that had this awesome study guide who went to this boot camp, I was able to benefit from that. And one of the most important things that I learned from these study guides was prioritizing the questions. And when I say prioritizing the questions, I'm talking about understanding the immediacy of the questions in all the questions on the licensing exam i think as social workers we think almost like too far ahead we need to think more immediately we need to think about safety we need to think about supervision we need to think about risks and we need to think about immediate immediate responses and i think sometimes i found I wasn't really going to the most immediate step. I was maybe going like a step after. So that was something really important that I learned was prioritizing, prioritizing, um, understanding the questions, especially in terms of immediately, the immediate response in the situation, which was usually about safety or seeking supervision, (laughs) to be quite honest. Um, So understanding how the questions what the questions are really asking you and how to navigate that. The day before I took my exam, I had purchased the official ASWB practice examination. In the back of the Dawn Apgar study guide, it had different, I think it had a whole entire practice test back there. I did not take that practice test, um, mostly because of a time constraint. I was very busy with work. I just didn't have time. It was in my study plan to take it because I wanted to be as prepared as possible. But the way that it worked out, I wasn't able to. So the night before my exam, I took the official ASWB practice exam, which is $85. And this is the one thing I don't understand about studying for this licensing exam is there are so many phenomenal resources out there, but they cost so much money. And to me, it's just like, we are entering social work where we are notoriously underpaid, where we're also like forced to go to grad school to get a master's, to get a license so we can get a better job in order to afford life. But then you tack on all of these expenses and that for resources that we need in order to get that license to get a better life (laughs) like it makes no sense I don't understand it Um, but just keep that in mind it can be very costly so like I said and honestly like the year or two years if you want to be super prepared leading up to your exam start saving money just put some money aside in a savings account because you're gonna spend it on study materials um Going back to what I was saying before that tangent, I took the practice exam. This was the best decision I ever made. And the reason I decided to wait until the night before my exam was because I really wanted to test my knowledge. I really wanted to see where I was at. And I was scared that if I took it any earlier and I failed, that it would be very difficult for me to feel confident going into the exam. That was something I knew about myself. Everyone is different, though. So know what works for you. I wanted to take it the night before. If I had failed the night before, that would be another story. Luckily, I passed the practice exam, which gave me a lot of confidence. And for this exam, I passed by 108, I believe, which was honestly a lot lower than what I actually passed by on the exam I took. I passed by 125. And I think the difference was that after taking the official practice exam, what you could do was you could go back and review all of the questions, the ones you got wrong, the ones you got right, and it provided the rationale, which was amazing. 
And something I noticed, that's when I really started to see that pattern was even though I passed, um, in terms of understanding the questions, I was, I wasn't quite there yet in terms of really grasping like the immediacy of the questions, like here and now, what do you do? What is the best option? What is the next thing you do after this? What's the last thing you do? What's the worst? What's the best? All these different questions like that. So go, actually taking the official exam, it also is formatted exactly like the actual exam, which took a lot of anxiety away because the day of the exam, you know, I'm in this computer lab place taking it and everything was very familiar. So that took some anxiety away. Um, and then I really reviewed the types of questions I was getting wrong on the official practice exam. And some big things that stood out to me was medications, safety, risk factors, um, diagnostic criteria, ethics, cultural competence. For some people, it feels like I just rattled off everything you need to study. But these are some things I just needed more details on. So I had like really good knowledge on them, but there were like some things that were very, very specific. And I kid you not, I... Oh my gosh, I like memorized the criteria for all these different diagnoses. I understood the differences between them. I had a really good understanding of all these medications, like 50 different medications. And you want to know what was on my exam? I had one question about medication. <laughs> I had one question about like an actual like diagnosis. Maybe I had like three diagnosis questions. But for the amount of studying I did... I'm just like, wow, it was worth it. You know, those are questions that counted towards my success, hopefully, if they were the scored items. But I always just think that's funny, you know, to study so hard for just one question. But at least in that moment, I knew I got it right because I felt confident in it. So those were the things that helped me pass the exam. Um, something I tried at the beginning was I joined a lot of Facebook groups and I actually found that I did not like that because it was giving me more anxiety. It was making me a lot more nervous for the exam because the only thing I would see would be people failing and people being, and I don't, I don't want this to hurt anyone's feelings for people who are, you know, who have attempted multiple times to pass the exam, but that, it just felt like that was the only thing that was happening in this group, in these Facebook groups I was in, was people were just announcing, well, I failed again. Well, I failed again. Well, I failed again, <laughs> and it was, it was really starting to upset me, and I'm just like, this is not encouraging. Um, this is making me feel more nervous about the exam and more hopeless, so I ended up leaving the groups, and I think I was better for it, but if you find support in groups like that, go for it. And now in terms of the actual exam, I don't think I can like dive into what was on it. Like in the study guides, like Don Apgar and everything, it'll break down the percentages of the different categories um, that are on the exam. The same thing in the pocket prep book. It's like split into like quarters or something like that. Like um, human development, ethics, other things. It's like four cat four general categories and you know, it dives into all the information. But honestly, a big part was just being prepared and understanding what the questions were actually asking. While I was taking the exam, I was so nervous. And what was so crazy about this to me was, I mean, you're there, you're sitting in this testing center, right? There are other people around you taking whatever exams they're taking. It's not like a social work test center. So everyone else is taking other office of profession exams. And there was not one point during the exam where I was calm and collected. <laughs> and I thought, because usually what happens was, you know, I'm nervous for a test, but as you're going through it, you know, it starts to ease. I kid you not, I was tense the entire time I was taking that exam. The whole entire 170 questions. And I think what it was, was because during the entire exam, there was really not one point where I was like, oh yeah, I definitely got that question right. <laughs> and I think it's not because I didn't know the material and I don't, 
when I'm not good at social work, but it's because of the way that the questions were worded. Sometimes you can really psych yourself out and you can really be like, wait, are they asking me this? Or are they trying to ask me this? Or, and so sometimes it's really hard to know, you know, did I answer the question the way that they wanted me to answer it? Or did I read too much into it? Or did I not interpret the question correctly? So that was hard. And it wasn't until literally the end of the test, I got through the 170 questions. I reviewed all the questions. You have time to do that. Review your questions, please. If you don't have a question answer ready when you are at that question, you can flag it and go back and answer the question. Remember to do that. Um, and again, if you have time, please review your questions. So, and at the end, it'll show you, it'll also tell you before you officially submit it, if there's questions left over, if there's ones that you flagged that you haven't answered yet, it'll ask you, are you sure? Are you sure? And you can go back and make sure you've answered those questions. Um, so I finally am done with my exam and I click submit and it tells me nothing because right after you're done with this exam, it wants you to take a 10 question survey on your test center experience. And at this point, I'm literally freaking out. My heartbeat is so high. I had just submitted my exam and I thought I would see the score immediately. And it didn't tell me anything because it wants me to answer this 10 question survey before finding out my score. I didn't, I didn't read through any of the survey questions, to be quite honest with you. I just clicked the very first button that was there. I just breezed through the survey, and I finally submitted the survey, and boom, right there on the screen, it said, pass. You passed your exam. So that was a relief. Um, then, you know, you're done with the exam. I leave. I go out to the front, and I give, like, the key. I get the key for my locker where my stuff is stored and the person that's out there is the one that has printed off your test score and gives it to you so that's like the unofficial test report that people often take pictures of and share that they passed so that was when you actually see how many questions you got right to get you to pass so when you actually submit it on the computer it doesn't tell you how many questions you got right it just tells you that you passed but when you actually collect the printed confirmation unofficial document um, that's where it kind of breaks down the numbers so my experience with getting my license it was a long one um, to be quite honest, it was a, a lot of it was long because of COVID. A lot of it was long because of a fault of my own, because I overslept the first time, which, you know, was that my fault or was I burnt out or was I burnt out because of not having boundaries? That's a whole other thing. Um, but overall, um, it was stressful. It was stressful. It was a lot of information. There were some moments I was really like, oh my gosh, am I really going to remember all of this? Am I really going to pass this exam? And I was scared because um, I'm a planner. I have a five-year plan. I have a 10-year plan. I have a 20-year plan. I have a lot of plans. And, you know, I'm learning to find this balance of being okay with, you know, flexibility and not having everything so strategic and planned out. But I don't know. I didn't expect to take my licensing exam so long after I graduated school. I thought I'd be taking it like as soon as I graduated and it took me a year to take it. Um, but I'm glad it happened that way because I was able to pass it on the first try and because I was more prepared, I gave myself the time and space to study. My temporary permit lasted a, a year, so I had the time. Um, but if you are practicing with your permit and you're taking your exam, it, there can be that pressure there, you know. You only have so many chances when you're on your temporary permit, especially if you're job is on the line if you don't pass the licensing exam so that is certainly an added pressure but please you know take a breath take care of yourself you know everyone says you know to relax the day before the day of the exam that has never worked for me um and i really just want to say do what works for you if i had to go get a massage the day before my exam i would be so much more nervous <laughs> um i like to be prepared i like to stay up late and study 
I'm honestly, to be quite frank, I'm a crammer. I like to cram for exams. I like to study late at night. I like to study the day of. None of that really bothers me. So I think really the essence of this is the material is the state is the same for everybody, right? The questions, the question format, it's all the same. But how you understand it, how you can incorporate that material and synthesize it for your knowledge, that's for you, you know? So you know yourself best and that's ultimately the thing that you can rely on the most. So learn about yourself. Learn what things work for you and what things don't work for you and ditch the things that don't work. If Facebook study groups don't work for you, get those things out of your life. So this was kind of a rambly podcast. I do apologize. I didn't have a lot of it planned out. So if I missed any important things or if you guys have any questions, please, please, please let me know in the comments. You know, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook at Social Work Bub or the Social Work Bubble. I also have my website that has a contact page, thesocialworkbubble.com. I have my Etsy shop where you can buy, you know, social work and therapy and mental health worksheets, games, and activities. Um, So just reach out, you know, and if you want to share this podcast with someone who's about to be licensed, new graduates, current grad school students, undergrad students, whatever it is, um, feel free. But, and honestly, if you don't even have a question, but you just want to share your experience, maybe you live in another state, maybe you live in New York, but you transferred your score from another state, you need to share your experience and share the knowledge. So thank you all so much for listening and I will see you next time.